Hello, good afternoon to everyone. Um, I am Felipe Vilella. Uh, I am, this is the last talk of this workshop. Um, this, is, uh, this talk is from, I am a member of the research department of iGenomics, and we are focused not only in the have new knowledge about reproductive medicine. We are focused as well in to improve all of our products of the company, having a new point of view and having a point of view in the near future. For that reason, this is the last talk because we are having uh, this look on the near future, on the using as a non-invasive or at least less invasive new methods to predict the endometrial receptivity. This is an image uh, from a paper that we published in Science in uh, 2013. And I don't like to enter in the complexity of the molecular interplay to successful uh, proper implantation, but it's important to know that at least we need three different things. We need a proper employed embryo, we need a receptive endometrium that is what related these talks, but as well we need a crosstalk or at least a dialogue between the embryo and the endometrium. And to produce this dialogue between both is because the endometrium are secreting some specific molecules to the endometrial fluid and the embryo secreting some specific molecules to this endometrial fluid that can communicate one to each other. Taking this point of view, taking these molecules that can be secreted from the endometrium or from the embryo we can use these new molecules as a possible new biomarkers that can help to predict this endometrial receptivity. I don't would like to enter in deep in this image because my colleague, Professor Simon, um, already explained it, but this is quite important that when we have an euploid embryo, and he already mentioned that it's easy that this embryo is attaching practically in everywhere. It's obviously attaching in the, in the catheter that then, which is the important role. <coughs> These are the important role for us in this workshop, that it's the endometrium. The endometrium need to be in the specific receptive moment. And it's really important because we can have the best embryo of the world, but if we don't have a receptive endometrium, we will lose our embryo. Neither I would like to enter again in the endometrial dating that's mainly is nobody's using at this moment. And we had the endometrial receptivity array, or now the endometrial receptivity analysis, that it works fantastically, as my colleagues already demonstrated. But this is the important part of my talk, that we need to focus in the next generation endometrial diagnostic methods. And for that, what is important? These new methods need to be non-invasive need to have an embryo transfer must be performed in the same cycle. This is also really important. And the implantation rate itself should be the end point of our, uh, our new uh, generation diagnostics. Having this point of view, we started to think about it. Where, where is this embryo? What is this embryo before attaching to the endometrium? is surrounded by the endometrial fluid. This endometrial fluid is secreted by the glands of the epithelia, and with this endometrial fluid is a lot of different molecules that are secreted by the endometrium, and maybe these molecules that helps to nurture, help to develop it to the embryo, there is plenty of paper explaining what these molecules are produced, but these molecules can be helping to us to use as biomarkers, or now by new biomarkers. This is a, just an image, right? I love that image, it's from Carnegie Collection in the United States. This is a human embryo after the invasion, and in here, all of that is surrounded by some specific fluid. That it's from this fluid that is secreted from the glands of the endometrium, and some authors call us the uterine milk. And this is where I'm focused in this endometrial fluid. During the last years, uh, from our laboratory, we published some specific molecules that are secreted to this endometrial fluid, among other molecules se um, identified by other colleagues in other laboratories. For example, interleukins, proteins from Salomonsen laboratories, cytokines, 
and recently the specific lipids. And I will focus the half part of my talk in these lipids. Why we use the secretomics on the endometrial receptivity? First, because it was published by Van der Gast in 2002 from the group of Nick McClone that the aspiration of the endometrial secretions does not affect the pregnancy rates. The glycodilin levels correlate with menstrual cycle phases on endometrial aspirations, and in our laboratory, we demonstrated that the profile of specific cytokines can be determined in endometrial secretions. And in 2013, we published that the two specific lipids, prostaglandin E2 and prostaglandin F2-alpha, are identified on this endometrial fluid, and we observe that are important for embryo addition. This is the paper. Uh, this is the manuscript that we publish in JCM. This is uh, in collaboration. Uh, we obtain specific support for the Gram for Fertility Innovation from Merck Serono. And we publish this paper suggesting that these two prostaglandins are important for embryo implantation and can be used as biomarkers for this moment of the window of implantation. This is the first part of my talk. I will focus in this new non-invasive diagnostic method of human endometrial receptivity based, based on the specific lipidomic profile in the endometrial fluid. For this study, in the beginning, we obtained the endometrial fluid using a specific transfer catheter. It's the same transfer catheter that they use in the, all the gynecologists mm -hmm. to perform the embryo transfer, obtaining a, an a amount between 10 20, at least to 80 microliters of endometrial fluid. Obviously, when we obtain this endometrial fluid, we are not obtaining tissue, because if not, that will be a biopsy. It's just the endometrial fluid. And we analyze the content of the lipids of this endometrial fluid using lipid chromatography and malditov tov to identify which lipids there are there. We observed, this was our first observation, that we identify 10 specific lipids, but two were differentially secreted during the window of implantation. This is a natural cycle. This is uh, 51 patients obtaining endometrial fluid from 51 patients during natural cycle. And we observed that at the moment of the window of implantation, during the days 19 to 23, we observed a significantly increase of these two lipids, prostaglandin E2 and prostaglandin F2-alpha. Just to corroborate that, we design a specific, a specific uh, protocol that we obtained from the same ovum donors underwent consecutive treatments, a total of 30 patients, that firstly, we had an HRT cycle, second, have a control ovarian stimulated cycle, and third, have a hormonal uh, replacement uh, treatment plus an intrauterine device to generate a refractory endometrium. What we observe from the first group, from the patients that are become on the HRT cycle, we observe that there is a specific increase of both lipids, prostaglandin E2 and prostaglandin F2-alpha, at the moment of the P plus 5. That's the same as at the moment of the window of implantation. That's the moment of the receptivity, indicating that with the progesterone um, treatment, we observe exactly the same as in the natural cycles. On the window of implantation, there is increased both prostaglandins. <laughs> Happen the same with the control ovarian stimulated cycles. After seven days of HCG, we observe a significant increase of these prostaglandins during the moment on the window of implantation. And what happens with the patients that had a refractory endometrium? Remember, as the same patients, same cycle, but with the intrauterine device. In these patients, if you remember two slides before, we observed that during the moment of the window of implantation, there are an increase of these prostaglandins at the P plus five. There is an increase of both prostaglandins. And after that, when we had an intrauterine device, on the P plus 5, there is disappear this increasing of these prostaglandins, indicating that the prostaglandins are secreted at the moment of the window of implantation when the endometrium is receptive. Looking for that, uh, we 
next questions because we are scientists and we always have this this moment that oh, okay and this this should happen for something you know if these prostaglandins and there they need play any specific role with the with the embryo we check it which are the possible relations between these prostaglandins that are secreted by the endometrium and which can be the relation with the uh, embryo and we observe that the cells of the trophoectoderm express specific uh, receptors for these prostaglandins that can transfer the signal of the identification of these prostaglandins, can transfer it and intracellularly and produce some specific changes on the embryo. There is four specific receptors for prostaglandin E2 and one specific receptor for prostaglandin F2-alpha that can recognize on the trophoectodermal cells of the embryo can recognize these prostaglandins and produce specific transcriptomical changes. To demonstrate it, if these have any specific uh, relation with the embryo implantation or with receptivity during this moment, we use mouse embryos, of course, uh, as a model of the human embryos, and we observe that the, one of these receptors, prostaglandin, EP2 receptor that it's for the prostaglandin E2 is highly expressed, it's, it's in green, it's highly expressed in the cells of the trophoectoderm. And we observe a really huge, huge expression of the prostaglandin FP receptor that it's for the prostaglandin uh, PGF2 alpha. Now, if you remember in my previous slides, prostaglandin F2 alpha, it's the one that it's more highly secreted to the endometrial fluid. We can see it clearly here. This is the mouse embryo. In blue, there is the nucleus of the trophoectodermal cells. And we can see it, how it's surrounded with this green signal that it's the signal of the receptors, meaning that there is a really huge expression of these receptors that it means that they can receive the signal of these prostaglandins. We have the same for uh, FP, that it's the receptor for prostaglandin F2 alpha. And this is the hatching area of the embryo, and you can see it how huge, how massive is the expression of this receptor on this uh, section of the embryo, indicating that can play a role if the prostaglandin can recognize the receptor. To demonstrate that, we perform an experiment, an in vitro uh, experiment, to see if there is any relation on the uh, these prostaglandins with the embryo implantation. To perform this kind of experiments, this is completely in vitro. We have an epithelial cells plated on plates in the laboratory, and we co-culture with mouse embryos uh, these epithelial cells. This is the normal situation of percentage of embryo adhesion in this co-culture, that it's around 40-45% in normal conditions, but when we use a specific drugs, that it's the indometacin, that we can block completely the secretion of prostaglandins to the media, we observe a massive decrease on the embryo adhesion, showing that these prostaglandins are important for the embryo adhesion. When we add back these prostaglandins to the media on this in vitro experiment, we observe an increase on the embryo adhesion higher than the normal uh, situation, meaning that the prostaglandins play a specific role on the embryo implantation. With all of that, we said, okay, maybe after describing all of the science of this section, say maybe these prostaglandins, can we use it as a possible biomarkers of this window of implantation? For that, we perform a pilot study with a really small number of patients that we obtain an endometrial fluid 24 hours prior to the embryo transfer. And we divide it in two different groups. One group that we perform an embryo transfer in day three, obtaining 24 hours before the uh, endometrial fluid. And we observe, look that the numbers are not really huge, there are 20, 20 total patients, but we observe that the patients that become pregnant have higher levels, significantly differential, than the patients that don't become pregnant, having a sensitivity and a specificity really high, indicating that maybe these two prostaglandins can be used as a possible biomarkers. 
We performed the same. We obtained 24 hours prior to the embryo transfer at day five, uh, the endometrial fluid. And we observed an increase in eight pregnant women have higher levels than the non-pregnant women, meaning that definitely we can use it, this possible biomarker in both conditions, in day three and in day five, embryo transfer showing that can be something really easy to perform directly on the clinic, obtaining just the endometrial fluid 24 hours prior to the embryo transfer, came the patient to the clinic, obtained the endometrial fluid, and with a specific device that we are designing, um, maybe we can just measure these prostaglandins and say that it's tomorrow is a good day for the embryo transfer or not. For that, we need a clinical validation. And this is the stuff that we are performing at this moment. We designed a huge, massive clinical validation with three branches that we have one fair branch with 100 patients in all the normal conditions that we found in the clinic just to define the proper cutoff with a proper um, amount of patients number, check it by uh, statistics. And then we will perform to more branches of this study, that one would be with 60 patients above the cutoff of the threshold that we define in this first section, and 60 patients below of the cutoff of this threshold. If we can have success results with that, we can definitely uh, design a specific uh, device that can use it for predict endometrial receptivity 24 hours in advance. Obviously, we start to work on that. We have a collaboration with the company Millipore, just because, if you remember, uh, we mainly first, we identified this prostaglandin using mass spectrometry. Obviously, this is a really complex technique that is not useful to use on the clinic. We need to, we, we need to have one step forward from that to don't use these complicated techniques that will have a delay and, and they will need specific people that know properly how it works. And then working with Millipore, we design for this validation study a specific ELISA kit that have a really good sensibility, have the same sensibility as we have with a mass spectrometry. We can detect in prostaglandin 2 and in prostaglandin F2 alpha in the endometrial fluid, we can detect amounts of 0.1 nanograms per microliter of these prostaglandins. Same, same for PGF2 alpha and PGA2. Now, with this uh, ELISA kit created, we're starting our clinical validation. And this is the results that I have today. You know, we have arrived in the, we are in the first branch of the study. We have a total of 42. Um, patients already analyzed. At least at this moment, we are not separated in day three and day five because this, with this 42, we don't have enough patients to have enough power statistically to demonstrate the differences between day three and day five. But when we analyze using this ELISA kit, we observe that the patients that we obtain 24 hours, this uh, endometrial fluid, they become implantation on these patients look at how higher are the am amounts of prostaglandins in comparison with the non-implantation. Obviously, we still have a, in, 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 uh, there's a standard deviation that is quite huge. That's this this uh, standard deviation is quite huge because we didn't separate it, the patients between day three and day five. That can the measures are not exactly uh, the the same quantity of prostaglandins are not exactly the same between day three and day five. But obviously, we observe that the the all the stuff that we see it in our previous publication is still maintaining, and that keeps that this. A study will be finished during this year. The full, the three branches will be finished during this year to define if we have a specific threshold that we can use it. And then the last point is not use an ELISA kit because also it's still complicated to perform it in the in the clinic every day. We are thinking to have a specific device that just taking the knowledge of uh, sorry taking the knowledge of uh, of this ELISA kit have a specific device like something similar to a predictor that obtaining the endometrial fluid 
just get dissolved with a specific buffer that we can design in the same terms of the of the LISA kit and just putting on this device and then having a colorimetric stuff that can be red or, or green or if it can become implantation or not on the next day. Okay, and then this is the conclusions of the first part. Remember I say that I, there are two parts. <laughs> we demonstrate a putative biomarker profile in human endometrial receptivity composite by prostaglandin E2 and prostaglandin F2-alpha that is consistent in natural control ovarian stimulated and HRT cycles and is abrogated with the insertion of the intrauterine device. Uh, we observe that and these uh, prostaglandins can react with the two specific receptors, EP2 and FP receptor, present in the trophoectoderm of the blastocyst. Using an in vitro model of embryo addition, uh, chemical inhibitors of prostaglandin synthesis reduces the blastocyst addition, which restores by adding back the PGA2 and the PGF2-alpha already identified, and regulating the antagonist and, and agonist of these receptors. The clinical translation of this work is demonstrated by the diagnostic accuracy in terms of sensitivity and specificity of PGA2 and PGF2-alpha concentrations in endometrial fluid obtained 24 hours prior, day three, or day five embryo transfer, predicting the pregnancy outcome. And now, and this is the last results that I show today, that we are performing the clinical validation of these biomarkers. But then, before, before somebody asked me the question, we said, okay, and what happens if the, your device become red? <laughs> what, what I should do? Well, we are working because the endometrial receptivity analysis is the key question. If the a device become red, maybe it's because there is a displacement or it's a problem with the window of implantation, and we need to detect when this window of implantation occurs. We are working in the next generation of the endometrial receptivity array and we are going for a non-invasive or at least less invasive diagnostic method of this using a single cell analysis using endometrial fluid. We identify during this time, looking for the next generation of the endometrial receptivity analysis, that the obtaining the endometrial fluid, you can obtain a really tiny amount of cells that are still alive. There are cells that are maybe secreted or they are be becoming from the, with the fluid from the glands that are maybe starting to enter in apoptosis, but we can catch these cells and we can, during the moment that are still alive that don't enter in apoptosis, we can analyze the transcriptome using the single cell analysis. For that, uh, we obtain the endometrial fluid and we analyze using the method of fluid hygiene. That it's a method that is, uh, was previously described by Professor Stephen Quake in the University of Stanford, and we are collaborating with him in this project, obtaining these samples, obtaining this endometrial fluid, separating these cells, eliminating, of course, all of the dead cells that can generate a mistaking um, analysis, loading in a specific chips that in every chip can load one cell per dot, and we can deep sequencing this specific cell and have the full transcriptome of the cell. This is real. <laughs> this is the, the cells of the endometrial fluid. These are the cells load on the endometrial fluid, load on this chip, and we can see it, thank you so much, and we can see it how in, not in all of the spots, but in the majority of the spots, we have these green dots, these green dots is just one cell identified on this endometrial fluid and is green because it's still alive. We have a specific marker to com be completely sure that this cell is not entering in apoptosis. When the cells enter in apoptosis, they become on this color, that it's uh, this yellow color. These are more yellow and these ones are not definitely analyzed. With that, we're starting to analyze the cells of this endometrial fluid when we have these nice cells that is really rounded cell, really green, really perfectly located on the spot. We can have a good uh, RNA extraction. And when the cell starting to see that it's more yellow and there is not enough rounded and it's not nice, we observe that the, the quality of the RNA is starting to decrease. This is the example 
that they, for example, from this cell, that it's a good one, that it's a live cell, we can obtain 34% of the total genome reads. Now it means that we can perform a full transcriptomic analysis. And now the question is, okay, and these cells of this endometrial fluid, which kind of cells there are? There are epithelial cells, there are stromal, there are glandular, there are luminal, which kind of cells there are, these ones? Because when we analyze our stuff with the endometrial receptivity analysis, we have a biopsy. That it means that we will have stroma, we will have epithelial luminal, epithelial glandular. We need to know which kind of cells there are. For that, we firstly, in the laboratory, we isolated from a biopsy the epithelial cells and the stromal cells. Using the same technology, we isolated single cells. We analyzed the transcriptome per every single cell, and we see that the stromal cells, the transcriptome of the stromal cells, classify properly, differentially from the epithelial cells. That it means that we can just, using the transcriptome, we can classify which are these cells. We compare with the, our endometrial fluid cells from the previous image after the, after the deep sequencing, and we <coughs> observe that the majority of our endometrial fluid cells logically classify with the epithelial cells that are the cells that are more in contact with the endometrial fluid. Look at this PCI. With this PCI, in blue, we have the epithelial cells. In green, we have the stromal cells. These are from a proper separation in the laboratory. We know from a biopsy. And then we run our um, endometrial fluid cells. And we see that the majority of the, our endometrial fluid cells classify with the epithelial cells. Now we are working on that, and we are analyzing these endometrial fluid cells and trying to classify all the full transcriptome of these cells. To arrive a moment, we are uh, this, this, this project we have finished this year. Let me let me one year more at least, <laughs> you know. But to analyze this endometrial fluid, finally comparing our endometrial receptivity analysis um, genes with the genes that we can identify on these cells, and then just going obtaining endometrial fluid and perform the endometrial receptivity analysis directly from this endometrial fluid, and obviously done using this single cell analysis, just going in bulk because we already describe, hopefully, we will already describe which are the transcriptome from the endometrial receptivity analysis we need to define where is the window of implantation. Just, uh, I'm finished here, just I would like everything that we are performing in the research department, we can lo um, locate it in the iGenomic website we definitely would like to show that the endometrial receptivity database that it's uh, sponsored by iGenomics, EV, and University of Valencia, you will find there all the transcriptome of the endometrium, everything that it's published today, uh, you can find it there. Just put in the name of the gene, you will find all the publications and what these genes are related on, and it's free. You just enter, it's a, it's a free website. And just thank you to all of our team because obviously this is not the work of just one person. It's a work of a really huge team, a really clever person having lots of rhyme stormings every day. Thank you so much. <laughs>